I was, uh, man, I was antsy. I was ready to go. I was just, uh, man, let's get service started. Let's get this on. And I don't know if it was because of, because of the Bible and how I love to preach the Bible, or if it was just uh, because we have a basketball game afterwards. So, you you could you can decide for yourself which one that is. Uh, Judges chapter number nine. Uh, let me give you the context of our passage. Um, in Judges chapter number 8, uh, you'll find the story of Gideon and his 300 men, and they had to uh, encamp themselves, surround themselves around the Midianites, and that's where God uh, used those 300 men with their trumpets and with their pitchers and lanterns, and they, and they basically just shouted the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, and, and 120,000 people killed themselves uh, in that Midianite camp. And then towards the end of chapter 8, you'll find where Gideon takes his 300 men and he chases the 15,000 that got away and he uh, takes care of the 15,000 that got away with his 300 men. And then you'll find towards the end of chapter 8, the very end of chapter 8, God gives you a little snippet of Gideon. Uh, Gideon's kind of, uh, I guess you could say, his uh, his sin, uh, his wrongdoing. Um, In chapter, end of chapter 8, you'll find it, I think it's in verse 30, uh, you'll find where uh, Gideon uh, has like 70 sons, and then on, on, and because he married many wives, he had 70 sons. It wasn't just one wife. That would be, that would be brutal. Good night. Can you imagine that, mothers out there? 70 sons, yeah. Uh, he had uh, many wives, and then on top of uh, the many wives that Gideon had, uh, he also had an affair uh, with a lady, and you'll find that uh, the name of that son uh, that came from that relationship uh, was Abimelech, and that's where we're going to jump into uh, chapter number nine with this uh, this guy Abimelech, and Abimelech he is an interesting character. So he is a I guess a half uh, brother of Gideon's uh, family. Uh, if you if you understand Jewish culture at that time, he basically would not be included in the inheritance and in the family inheritance, and so he was looked upon as an outcast, uh, not part of Gideon's family, and so. He kind of basically just kind of sheltered himself and kept himself uh, aside. And if you remember from uh, Gideon's story, at the end of Gideon's conquering of the 135,000, uh, they, the people of Israel came to Gideon and said, hey, would you be our king? We want you to be our king, and we want your sons to be our king. We, we want you to be our king. And if you know uh, how uh, the Jewish culture was set up, they set up as a theocracy where God is the king. And here these men of Israel are saying, hey, you, you conquered all these things, you did all this, why don't you be our king? And Gideon looks at them and he says, no, I will not be your king, neither will my sons be your king, the Lord ruleth over you. And that was his answer in, Ju- in Judges chapter number 8. And here you find in Judges chapter 9, for sake of time, I'm just going to give you a summation of what happens. Abimelech gets word that they're trying to make Gideon king, and now Gideon is dead. So now that rightful heir to the throne, if you say, now falls to the sons of Gideon. And Abimelech says, if my half-brothers are not going to take it, then I should probably take it. And so here Abimelech schemes and connives in the first few verses here to basically take that role of leadership in the kingdom of Israel. And so what happens in the first uh, two verses, uh, Abimelech is going to basically gather himself an army. The Bible uses the term of light and vain persons, basically a bunch of criminals. Uh, he gathers together to, uh, as an army. He marches into where his father's family's uh, home is, and he gathers up all of those uh, those sons, and he takes them to a stone, and there he slays them. Kind of, that if you're gonna if you're gonna make yourself king, you might as well eliminate the competition. And so that's what he does. He he goes and he slays them. That's where we're gonna pick up our text in verse number seven. So all of the sons have been killed. Abimelech is now made king in verse number six. And verse number seven is our text. It says, and when they told it to Jotham. Now, Jotham, you'll find in verse number 5 that he is the youngest son of Gideon, and he escaped. Uh, He is the lone survivor of his brethren. Uh, So, verse number 7, they told it to Jotham. He went and uh, stood in the top of the mountain, Gerizim, and lifted up his voice and cried and said unto them, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, 
that God may hearken unto you. And then he begins this parable. It says, The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness, wherewith by me they honor God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? And the trees said to the fig tree, Come thou, and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit, and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said the trees unto the vine, Come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said all the trees unto the bramble, Come thou and reign over us. And the bramble said unto the trees, If in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. If not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now therefore, if ye have done truly and sincerely, in that ye have made Abimelech king, and if ye had dealt well with Jerubbabel, that would be Gideon, and his house, and have done it unto him according to the deserving of his hands, and here's a parenthetical phrase here, it says, For my father fought with, for you, and adventured his life far, and delivered you out of the hand of Midian, and ye are risen up against my father's house this day, and have slain his sons three score and ten persons upon one stone, and have made Abimelech the son of his maidservant, king over the men of Shechem, because uh, he is your brother. If ye then have dealt truly and sincerely with Jerubbaal, and with his house this day, then rejoice ye in Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come out from Abimelech, devour the men of Shechem, and the house of Milo, and set fire come out from the men of Shechem, and from the house of Milo, and devour Abimelech. And Jotham ran away and fled and went to Beer and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. We're going to stop there, but we're going to look at this parable, if you will, that Jotham declares. And really, he's, what he's really declaring is he's declaring a prophetic curse upon Abimelech and upon the men of Shechem for what they have done to the house of Gideon. And if you read on through the book of Judges, we're not going to look at it tonight, but if you read on through the book of uh, Judges chapter number 9, you'll find that that very curse that he prophesies comes true. What Abimelech is going to do is he's basically going to burn the men of Shechem alive inside of a tower. And then he's basically going to pursue after uh, the people who have escaped, and there uh, a woman is going to cast a stone out of a tower, the same the same uh, reference of how he killed uh, all of his brethren upon a stone. He is himself is going to be killed with a stone uh, cast upon uh, his head by a woman out of a window. Pretty, it's pretty awesome. It's kind of ironic. But that's how the Bible works. We're going to look at tonight in this little par uh, parable phrase uh, story here about these trees. I always love stories. I am a uh, by major, I am a history major, so I always love reading historical uh, references of whether it be battles or whether it be uh, different wars or whether it be key figures in history. Uh, I remember one, uh, probably one of my favorite books to read was a autobiography of Eddie Rickenbacker. Anybody familiar with who Eddie Rickenbacker is? Okay, you guys, all, it's amazing how all of the old people raise their hand and none of the young people raise their hand. Uh, Eddie Rickenbacker was a, was a pilot uh, in World War I. He was the, uh, probably one of the first aces in World War I uh, to be an ace. It sounds like you have to do something special. Really, you only have to shoot down five planes. That's all you have to do you know, with paper airplanes. It's really just, you just put a few holes in it, the plane goes down. But he was uh, one of the first uh, pilots in uh, World War I to be an ace. But this man was amazing. I mean, this guy, uh, I personally believe that he was a Christian. Uh, in his autobiography, he actually doesn't really mention that, but, but a few of the reference points uh, kind of allude to that. Uh, but he, uh, he started, uh, he started a, a car business. He, he manufactured his own cars. He was a race car driver. Uh, he drove race cars. Uh, he started uh, Eastern Airlines, which Eastern Airlines, I believe, is now American Airlines. Uh, basically, this guy did, you name it, this guy, like, did it all in his, like, really long lifetime. But I always love reading stories about uh, 
that have that have like really cool like satirical meanings. Um, I like the Pilgrim's Progress. How many of you guys are familiar with the book Pilgrim's Progress? All right, it is a very metaphorical book, and to, very similar to that uh, metaphorical book, you find this parable to be very metaphorical as well. If you look in our passage, you see how uh, Jotham starts out in verse number eight, how he says that there were trees that came uh, to an olive tree and said, why don't you be king over us? Well, let me give you some reference points to kind of help you uh, understand what what these are talking about. The trees in this story are referring to uh, the men of Shechem, the Israelites. And so these Israelites, these men of Shechem, come to the olive tree. And in this passage of Scripture, the olive tree is referring to Gideon. Uh, he, is, uh, he is the one who brought peace to the land because of the Midianites. And so they come to, uh, to this, uh, to this uh, olive tree, to Gideon, and they said, Reign thou over us. And then Gideon gives them an answer. In verse number 9, you'll see uh, that in our parable, he, leaves the, he says the answer, Should I leave my fatness wherewith by me they honor God and man and go to be promoted over trees? He's like, why should I leave what I got right here and go rule over you? Then if you, if you go to the next, they, they, they get a no from Gideon, and so the trees then move on to the, to the next thing, which was the fig trees. The fig trees in our passage refer to the sons of Gideon, refer, refer to those, uh, to those uh, 70 that got killed. Uh, that's, that's where those, uh, that fig tree represents. And then if you move down a little bit farther, it goes to the vine, uh, and the trees go to the vine and say, hey, vine, why don't you rule over us? That is actually referring to Jotham himself because he's the lone survivor, the last survivor of the house of Gideon. And so uh, the, he says, why, why should I, I, I leave what I got and go be over you? And then they go to the bramble, and bramble refers to Abimelech himself. And he said, why don't you, the thorn, uh, go ahead and rule over us, seeing as nobody else wants to do it anyway. And the bramble says, okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and do it if you really want me to. And so that's basically to give you a connotation of what this story is about. But I want to give you some application tonight about this story right here, because the truth is, in today's culture, and really in our lives today, we face the same story over and over and over in our lives. Because we always constantly have a battle that we face every day of who is going to be our king. Who is going to rule over us? Who is going to sit upon the throne of our heart? And just as the Israelites struggled with that all throughout their history, we struggle with it every day ourselves. And constantly we have to say, all right, it's not my will, but it's thine. It's not my will, but it's thine. So many times we're just like these Israelites, okay? Hey, you won a great battle, Gideon. No, no. No, have you forgotten the story of Gideon? Remember how he started with 32,000? And God said, hey, that's way too many. I don't want people getting the wrong idea. It's not about you, Gideon. It's It's about me. Tell everybody who's afraid, go home. Then he gets whittled down to 10,000. And then God's like, hey, whoa, that's still too many. I don't want people getting the wrong idea about who won this battle. But yet somehow, you fast forward, people still got the wrong idea about who won that battle. See, it's never been about a man. It's never been about the story of David and Goliath. It was never about David. It has nothing to do with David. David was just an instrument being used by God. You look at the story of Gideon, it's not about Gideon. Gideon was just a man. And he was a scaredy cat at that. But he was just an instrument being used by God. You go throughout all of of the Bible, you go throughout all of history, and you'll notice that every major spiritual victory had nothing to do with the man. It had everything to do with God. And it always has been and always will be about God. And until we settle the fact in our heart day after day after day about who is our king, you're always going to struggle. You're always going to have problems. You're always going to have misery. You're going to always have worries. 
You're always going to have doubts until you figure out that God is my king. Let me give you three points tonight of when God is king. Look at our text tonight. It says that in verse number 8, you see that when they went to the olive tree, when they went to Gideon, they said, rain down over us. And look how Gideon answers him. He says, the olive tree said unto them, should I leave my fatness wherewith by me they honor God and man and go to be promoted over trees? Here's what the olive tree answered. He said, you know what? I can't go anywhere because when God is my king, I have security. You know, many times in our lives, we, we look for security in all of the wrong places. We look for it in our finances. If I have X amount of dollars, I'm set. Maybe it's our job. Maybe if I, if I get this job, I'll be all right. Maybe it's, maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's a home. Maybe it's a family. Maybe it's a relationship that you're looking for. And you're saying, if I can get this, then, I, then I'm set. I'll be safe. No, I'm telling you right now, your security is not found in possessions. I'll even go this far. Your security is not found in the power of God. Your security is found in the will of God. God is powerful, and His presence is awesome, but it's more important for you to be in His will. It is safer for you to be in His will than just to know about the presence and power of God. Your security is found in the will of God. You saw it in our text. He says, how can I leave my fatness? Well, what is that talking about? Well, it's an olive tree. What do we use olives for? We use them for consumption. What did they use olives for? They used it for oil. That's what they used it for. They would take those olives and they would press them. They would squeeze them until they can get that oil from there. And then they would take that oil and they would use it to cook with. Here's what, here's what it's saying. It's saying, hey, I have security in the purpose that God has established my life for. Why would I give that up? Why would I give that up? I'm in the perfect will of God. Why would I give that up? Notice, nextly, when God is your king, look at the next verse. It says in verse number, uh, verse number 11, he goes to the fig tree, and, and they uh, say, uh, they tell the fig tree, hey, come reign over us. Verse number 11, the fig tree says unto them, should I forsake my, my sweetness and my good fruit and go be promoted over trees? Here's what this verse is saying. When God is your king, you have sweetness. You know, so many times, uh, I don't know if it's our, our, our fleshly, sinful nature, but we always think that the grass is greener on the other side. And we never realize how good we have it right where we're at right where we're at. Why do we need to go somewhere else? It's so good right where we're at. We sang the song, Count Your Blessings. Man, name them one by one. Man, have you really took time to do that? Man, God has been seriously good to us. Let's just start with the fact that He saved you. When you were lost in your sins, He gave you a way of escape. And He gave you hope for eternity. Hallelujah. Praise the Lamb. Just think about the fact that, hey, you could be sitting somewhere else tonight and not in church. But He gave you a church family to come and fellowship with. He gave you the Word of God to come and glean hope from, to come and glean encouragement from. Hey, have we forgotten how sweet it is to abide in His house? Man, it doesn't matter who sits in that chair. It has nothing to do with who sits in that chair. As long as he is still on the throne, I tell you tonight, we have it so good. Hey, when God is your king, you got sweetness. You got sweetness. Don't give that up for anything. Don't give it up for anything. Don't be tempted to, to, to leave church 
go pursue after something else, you won't find it better than you got it right here. Hey, when God is your king, you got sweetness. Not only do you got security, do you got sweetness, but I want you to see the last thing. Look at verse number, look at verse number 13. It says, uh, they go, in verse number 12, they go to the vine and say, Come thou, reign over us. Verse number 13, it says, The vine saith unto them, Should I leave my wine, which cheered God and men, and go to be promoted over the trees? That's not talking about wine like getting drunk, okay? Wine is translated there as fruit of the vine, okay? Just grape juice, that's all it is. Okay, so it doesn't promote drinking in the Bible. Uh, but here, here they come to the vine and say, hey, why don't you come rule over us? And the vine says, no. Why would I leave what I got here? When God is your king, you got satisfaction. You got satisfaction. I'll tell you what, um, when I got the news that Brother Skelly wasn't going to come, I was just kind of like, Okay. Uh, I remember I got the phone call, I think it was like 6.30 Thursday morning. And I remember uh, telling my dad that it's all right. It, it's all right. It, 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 was it disappointing? Yeah, it was disappointing. But it's all right. Because you know what? I don't necessarily need a pastor, but I do need my God. I do need my God, and I need to be pleasing to my God. And I'm telling you what, if you don't get a hold of this truth, you're going to be constantly disappointed, and you're going to be constantly looking for something else to satisfy you. You're going to be constantly looking for someone else or something else to bring you satisfaction. Oh, but I, I know who sits on my throne. And I am satisfied. I'm satisfied. And you know what the truth is? He doeth whatever he will. And I'm okay with that. I'm perfectly okay with that. When God is your king, Brings you security, brings you sweetness, and brings you satisfaction. It's really just a simple truth. But let me ask you tonight, who is your king? There's a couple ways you can answer that. You can give lip service and say, oh, God is my king, okay? How do you spend your time? How do you spend your time? Because where you spend your most time will determine who is really your king. How do you spend your money? Your resources? How do you use them? Where you spend your money will determine who is your king. That's, that's the honest truth. How are you using your talents? Because how and where you use your talents determines who is your king. That's the honest truth. Hey, when God is your king, you can have all those things. Security, sweetness, satisfaction, but if you're pursuing self, you're going to waste your time, you're going to waste your money, and you're going to waste your talents. Who is your king? Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your goodness to us tonight. Thank you for the simple truth of the word of God. Lord, just really a parable, just in the middle of a, of a crazy chapter. But yet, Lord, such, such truth that really kind of kind of hits home, and Lord, I pray that you just help us, Lord, to really take a look at ourselves and our hearts, and under, really just kind of take some time to meditate and ask ourselves these questions. Who is my king? 